Um, yeah, so web development, you know, first of all, <laughs> the web, web, the web is uh, one particular use of the internet, uh, an infrastructure that uh, has been uh, in development, and, you know, since the, you know, ever, ever since we, we, uh, uh, you know, we defeated the Germans in World War II, and, and folks were trying to understand how is it that we, that we won the war, right, and uh, it turns out that, you know, we just bombed the heck out of them, and um, we made it very, very hard to, uh, to communicate and um, and coordinate uh, uh, defensives and whatnot, so it was just well, <laughs> we we definitely don't want to be in the uh, in that same situation. What could, what could possibly do to avoid being in the same situation? So, um, yeah, there was a lot of uh, research on how could we uh, maintain uh, a, um, a communication uh, amongst uh, a you know, geographically dispersed uh, in. Uh, institutions and and army and whatnot and defense uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, would not you know that would, that would be very highly redundant and uh, that uh, would not be vulnerable to a single point of failure right and so um, you know during the 50s and 60s right there was a, a lot of research done by DARPA uh, that um, uh, you know they were looking to implement such a such a thing, right? On, on this this global, well, not global, at least within the United States, uh, a network that uh, could survive, uh, you know, a full on attack on the on the country, and and so this this evolved all throughout the '60s and '70s and '80s, uh, and it was um, you know eventually uh, opened up to uh, research institutions, universities. Right, and then in the '90s, right, it uh, expanded into a uh, commercial use. Uh, although you know, back then nobody had any idea what could, what could possibly you you could use this uh, for commercial purposes, right? Um, so so anyway, so it, it took on its a life of its own, right? And the rest is uh, is history. Um, so so the web happens to be just one particular use of the internet. So the internet is just just huge. Um, network of networks right that uh, allows uh, uh you know this there's a very very um, a familiar or a very popular way of architecting these networks into a client server uh where certain computers have a particular role uh, to play right and you have these centralized computers that uh, can receive communications from multiple clients right and that they they can then communicate with other servers so this this architecture uh, you know expanded uh, throughout the 70s and 80s uh, and then, and then uh, Tim Berners Lee, uh, um, you know, innocuously, or uh, uh, you know, he was trying to come up with a mechanism for being able to share uh, all sorts of uh, research uh, uh, with uh, his colleagues. Right? He, uh, he, you know, all by himself invented the uh, World Wide Web. Right? <laughs> he, he came up with a, a particular document uh, format that was easily editable uh, just with a plain uh, text uh, uh, editor, right? And you know, came up with the first browser, came up with the first uh, server, right? And all by himself uh, invented the, <laughs> the World Wide Web. Uh, but of course, there's, there's a lot of evolution that happened before then, right? There was, um, a, the, he, he, you know, obviously the, 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 the creation of the internet and all the different protocols that, uh, uh, these all these machines had to agree on right, which was uh, the development of TCP/IP as the main uh, uh, communication protocol to have all these computers be able to uh, uh, exchange data amongst themselves, right? And then you know, the development of this uh, client-server architecture, where uh, you have different computers in the same network uh, that um, uh, would play a specific role, right? Where um, you, you would have a very uh, obviously, we didn't, we didn't have these very powerful uh, machines uh, back then where everybody had a, a desktop uh, or a laptop even you know, to be able to take home, right? So you, you had these very rinky-dinky little terminal machines that uh, uh, were, weren't powerful at all, but were able to communicate with a central computer that uh, was powerful enough that all the reputation, right? And then uh, responding uh, to a client with a a, with the results of some some complex uh, computation, uh, so this this obviously evolved over time, and um, uh, folks were able to reduce uh, the sizes of these components, right? And eventually, you know, gave way to the uh, the personal computer revolution in the '80s, right? Where folks now could purchase these things, right, and then have one. Everyone have a, a desktop machine on you know on their personal 
uh, a, you know, office uh, or even at home, right? And they were cheap enough to to take home. Uh, and and then so you know this this uh, certainly allowed uh, you know the research that for that Tim Berners Lee was going through of of how well how how could now that we uh, have our terminals, uh, our computers, personal computers, and our on our desktops, you know how can we better share uh, information? And so he he uh, invented the uh, World Wide Web. You know he invented the uh, the the browser, the uh, the this uh, uh, unique identifier for all these different documents uh, on the various machines that were spread out over multiple servers. You know the URLs, right? The uniform resource locators. You know how do you find different files, right? That are being uh, hosted on all the all of these different uh, servers, right? Spread out over a large geographical area, right? And then and then came up with a standard of of um, of text, right, that um, uh, would be useful for a browser to parse, right, and then render something useful on the uh, on some on, on a window, right. And now the focus, his original focus, was to write research papers, right. So, so you see, a lot of the formatting is for research papers, right, headings and tables, um, and, and images and text and and paragraphs and whatnot and lists. Uh, so, so a lot of the original. Formatting right was gears towards this particular use case. Um, so so then then in the, in the so, so there was a huge explosion in the '90s uh, of folks using this you know, very very easy uh, mechanism of of publishing content and sharing with the rest of the world. It, you know, just like exponentially the, the content exponentially grew throughout the '90s uh, and in the 2000s. Folks, you know, started to we we, should, we started seeing some frameworks right that from uh, heavyweight um a, a software uh, companies you know, you know Microsoft um uh and Google and all, all these large corporations looking to uh, use uh, the uh the this framework this new framework right as a legitimate uh, infrastructure where you can build uh, applications right? so during the 2000s there was a lot of uh, uh research within companies of you know what these standards are what are the best practices design patterns a model view controller and things like that, uh, and and then you know that this gave way to to uh, 2010s, you know where there's uh, there's a you know the mobile computing uh, revolution where you know we were able to reduce uh, the size of uh, of computers to the you know to just a, a phone. We are we all are carrying these supercomputers uh, in our pockets, right? That were uh, that were fast enough to to communicate with the network, download and render, uh, you know, even 3D games on on such a small screens and whatnot. So and where we are right now in the 2020s, you know, who knows, right? Where uh, all sorts of great, uh, interesting, and exciting things are happening. Um, you know, we have a uh, Neuralink. Uh, perhaps we'll, we'll connect uh, our brains to <laughs> to the to the cloud. Uh, we have a global network that's uh, 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 being put on um, uh, in space, where you know might rival at some point, maybe might rival the the, the internet itself, right? Uh, we have you know. You know, uh, robotics uh, uh, always researching what the, the next uh, how, how to replace uh, humans, uh, you know, with uh, ChatGPT and all, all sorts of artificial intelligence um, that uh, uh, is very exciting, but also very you know, might threaten uh, all our jobs, right? <laughs> Pretty soon, who knows? Um, so, so yeah, so the the internet uh, is is this um, kind of like network of networks, right? Where uh, you might have uh, a network here in the university, another network at your at your uh, place of employment, right? And a network of some company, and all sorts of kind of distributed, and everybody maintaining their own network. Uh, but then also communicating, uh, connecting to a backbone or uh, some large, larger uh, global uh, infrastructure, right? That allows all these servers to communicate with one another. Uh, and so, so and this spread has spread over uh, the entire uh, world. Right where we now have uh, applications being hosted, you know, halfway across the world, uh, the server, you know, in Eastern Europe, and the database somewhere in California, right? And you are uh, running a browser here uh, on the East Coast, right? And and you have all these all these requests going out everywhere, right? Being responded from machines that are running halfway across the world, right? Um, so so this this uh, this architecture that was developed in the '60s is still with us, called the client-server architecture, and is certainly what we're going to be uh, uh, using here 
uh, in our in our class, right? So uh, clients for us is going to be uh, just a browser, but certainly could be anything, anything that can uh, initiate some kind of request for some kind of job or task to be done. Um, certainly before even the uh, uh, HTTP or the or the or the, or the um, the World Wide Web, uh, certainly there were, well, there still are different, many different types of clients, right? That they, there was just a, maybe a file transfer client, right? Where I, where I have on this machine, I want to go fetch some file that is uh, being hosted in some other server. And I can, you know, if I know the IP address of that server, I can go and tell my FTP client to go fetch that document and copy it over, right? Uh, there's email servers, certainly, right? There's uh, this SSH uh, clients and whatnot that allows us to log into remote machines and and uh, and and and, uh, and control them remote. So it's all sorts of clients and, and server architecture. You know, certainly printers or any shared resource. Typically, there's is connected to some server that manages right these shared resources. Uh, and, and so this this has evolved, and it certainly uh, has become a very very popular way of thinking on how how these applications are broken into uh, are, uh, are are broken up. Right. So. Uh, so the, we're certainly going to follow this uh, architecture in this class, um, and the course is, is roughly uh, split in in half here, where the first half of the uh, this course is going to focus on the client side, uh, where we're going to be you know building a, a user interface right uh, that is going to uh, based on the React JS uh, JavaScript library uh, that we're going to be using it to render a user interface, interact with the user. Uh, parse all sorts of events that the user generates as they you know, type at the keyboard or move their mouse, right, uh, or click and drag and whatnot, right. And so we're going to be able to implementing that in on a on a browser. It's going to run on a on a browser. But again, there's all sorts of other types of clients, right? You know, desktop applications, games, right, and whatnot that can generate requests. We're going to be generating requests from a React JS application that is running on a browser, right. Uh, and these requests are typically going to be uh, formatted using the HTTP protocol, you know, the hypertext uh, transfer protocol that is going to send these requests to a server. Uh, so the second half of, this, of the semester right, is going to be focusing on the server and database right uh, side of this uh, architecture. Uh, so these servers are going to receive these requests um, either for static content like an image um, or some text uh, uh, or even data, right? Data formatted on either as XML or formatted as JSON or just plain text, right? Or, or comma separated value. Um, and then and the server is responsible for uh, going out to, to uh, the, either the file system uh, or even to some other network um, or maybe to a database, right? To fetch these uh, resources, right? Whether it's a file for an image or song or an audio, right? That uh, it's gonna be streamed back to the, to the client. So yeah, so we're going to focus the first half of the semester uh, to the, developing the client, and the second half of the semester on servers and the uh, database. Okay. Um, yeah, so just a a, a, a very rough uh, a timeline, all, all sorts of things that have happened uh, on either side of this divide, right, of the client and the server. The server has evolved uh, kind of separately from the client, the, the different technologies uh, that are applicable on either one of these buckets, right? Has has had its own uh, you know, trajectory, its own history arc, right? Um, and so on the server side, uh, you know, there has been you know a lot of uh, uh, evolution uh, on different uh, languages, different frameworks, right? And and uh, uh, certainly in the '90s, uh, you know, the the uh, uh, folks were trying to uh, 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 you know early on. They, uh, they, when, when folks were, you know, looking at this new invention of the World Wide Web, uh, folks were saying, "Well, you know, how do we make this dynamic?" Right at, at the beginning, um, you know, Tim Burns Lee, he was just looking to have some, you know, static content, right? Just a, just a paper, a, a, um, a research paper that he wanted to share with his colleagues, right? And it was static, right? just static text formatted nicely. Uh, but you know, in the early '90s, folks were saying, "Well, how do we make this dynamic?" Right? So. Like for instance, if I want to make like a weather application, uh, certainly I don't want to have to, uh, you know, have to update this uh, every day, right? How, how can I make this dynamic so that 
depending on the weather, the temperature, or you know, what's uh, sunny or cloudy or whatnot. I like, I, like, I would like the application, right, the, the screen to be uh, rendered dynamically every time you come up to it, depend, depending on the weather, right? Or the stock, right, or things like that, and the things that change over time. So, uh, so folks were saying, well, you you have to be able to run or execute things, right, when uh, that uh, that when the request comes in from a client. Uh, you have to somehow execute something on the server that calculates a new version of that screen, right? And so the first solutions were these uh, common gateway interface, right? This was a, a mechanism that allowed you to uh, point to a, an executable file, uh, either written in Perl or C or C++, right? Uh, that um, then computed dynamically that output that was then streamed back to uh, the client for dynamic rendering. Uh, this this became a very very popular right and one of the leading the solutions uh, in you know mid nineties late nineties was uh, PHP right PHP you know took this idea uh, of uh, of you know being able to dynamically render content and really ran with the idea and 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 there was huge huge uh, investment of, uh, of design and implementation effort using the PHP language. Uh, and so as as it evolved in these you know in half a decade, uh, there were a lot of a lot of uh, projects that were built on this, and a lot of uh, a lot of patterns uh, started to emerge right on how to how to best build these applications right, uh, and and folks were documenting them as of what are the best practices, how to build these applications. These are these are very new ways of building applications right, um, and so folks were. Now they had a chance of working on so many projects, right? They were coming up with what best practices of what to do, what not to do. Uh, and so in the early 2000s, late 1990s, uh, Java um, you know, was, was a fairly uh, popular uh, language. And, um, and they, they were able to distill all these best practices into a framework, right? That they call the Java 2 Enterprise Edition, the J2EE, right? And so they were, come up, were able to, to define you know, the, the, a lot of design patterns that um, were very well known at the time, right? And and come up with, you know, how are they applicable uh, in large web applications, right? So they came up with the the model view controller design pattern, right? That uh, built or split up the application into three buckets, right? That dealt with the view, rendering the user interface, uh, the controller uh, in the middle for the middle tier for handling um, all the events that the user sends, right? Of clicking and dragging and whatnot. Right, how to serialize all those uh, events generated by the user, and then you know how how that affected the uh, the data model, you know all the the all the CRUD operations of creating, reading, updating, and deleting the data in the database. Right, so they come up with this uh, nice um, uh, thorough uh, uh, set of design patterns, and um, then obviously Microsoft uh, uh, also jumped into this idea and uh, with the .NET. Uh, framework that um, you know, had its its own version or even a better version uh, of the J2EE uh, implementation uh, using all sorts of languages like Visual Basic and ASPs and C Sharp and whatnot, right? Uh, then in the early 2000s, uh, again, this continued evolving and all sorts of other developments such as uh, in languages like Ruby and Rails, Django, Python, uh, Flask. Uh, and then in the late 2000s, uh, Node.js, uh, started to be become uh, very very prominent, uh, where JavaScript had been up to this point relegated uh, only for running on the on the clients right on the browsers, and had you know had uh, had had some some success there, uh, and uh, but then obviously Google and Facebooks of the world had a uh, you know you know, really, really took JavaScript on its own and developed it and matured it uh, enough to become you know a serious language. Uh, that that you know eventually is broke out of the browser right and was able uh, now to run also on a console right on on just an, on a regular desktop uh, so that it did not had no longer had the limitations of just running on a browser but now it could you know uh, be able to run on a desktop and have you know unfettered access to the file system uh, network or even databases right so so anyway so this this was all happening on the server side. Meantime, right on the on the client side, on the on the browser end, um, you know, I, I, again at the very beginning, um, um, Tim Berners Lee was was just looking to have uh, you know, be able to share a research paper with his with his friends 
colleagues, right? And so they were all static. And so, and, and so again, again, in the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, folks were looking at say, well, how do we make this dynamic, right? To, so that we could we could make it dynamic on the server, where the server can calculate a new page uh, from scratch, and or right, you can have logic running on a browser, right? And, and so a a, a language, uh, you know, JavaScript, uh, you know, developed by uh, Netscape became very very popular as a de facto language, right? That would execute on browsers. Uh, that could dynamically render pages or manipulate the uh, the page right, that was uh, being rendered on the screen. Right? Um, and, but but this was fairly slow, uh, and there were a lot of uh, limitations of what you could do on the JavaScript. There was also a lot of um, uh, a backlash of folks accepting. Uh, running JavaScript on their browsers, you know, folks would balk at the idea of saying, wait, what do you mean? You're, you're downloading JavaScript from you know, executable files from some other server that I'm going to allow to execute on my machine? What are you, crazy? There's no way I'm going to allow to do that. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, backlash on, on JavaScript. Folks were terrified of this idea uh, in, you know, cookies also, you know, uh, folks were, were looking to say, what do you mean they're going to be tracking me, everything I do? So folks were <laughs> not okay with uh, uh, allowing tracking. So sorry, this this kind of a, a, a space to, to alternative solutions such as Adobe Flash uh, that um, uh, where where was trying to fill in the gaps of uh, JavaScript, right? So and, and so these folks, uh, you know, Adobe had a, a a huge run and very successful. Um, uh, implementation of a full user interface framework, right? That allowed you to build all sorts of very dynamic, very um, uh, interesting uh, uh, applications, you know, full on applications running uh, on a browser, right? That was being downloaded <laughs> uh, and then executed uh, on, on browsers, right? You know, all sorts of games and, and media and streaming video and all sorts of uh, very, very cool things were built on top of uh, Adobe Flash. So anyway, but, but uh, uh, um, in parallel to this, right, JavaScript was also evolving. Both frameworks were being developed uh, to make JavaScript a more robust, a more mature uh, framework. Right, it, it was lacking a lot of things that were uh, that were available in full blown mature languages such as C sharp and Java, right, object orientation and whatnot. You know, JavaScript kind of had had like a pseudo version of that, but not not nearly as um, as evolved and serious as these other more mature languages. So, so there was a lot of attempts at, um, at evolving the language and creating frameworks that would uh, make the language more appealing. Um, there was, at uh, this time was also a huge uh, fight amongst all sorts of um, uh, companies, right? Trying to, you know, try, trying to capture some of that uh, inertia and interest a worldwide interest in the on the internet and the worldwide, and so so there was a and so folks started to realize that the that the the importance was to right to be able to control or or have have a a say on how the all this content was going to be consumed right uh, and so all the lot of uh, you know so, uh, in, uh, you know Apple and and Google and Microsoft and all these all these big players were. Um, got into this war on on you know who had the best browser, right? That that would now be the window into which we would be consuming uh, all this content, uh, and so this this created a fragmentation on uh, on the on on the implementation of the of the World Wide Web, uh, in, including the, um, uh, the 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 fragmentation of the JavaScript language itself, right? Uh, where each browser vendor had its own kind of different dial dialect of the of the language, and this this made it very tough for us developers to you know when we were building these applications, right, uh, having to target different types of vendor. You know, so it was like a, you know you had a C. Well, the same thing happened when you were doing C or C plus plus, right, and you had to be able to target different uh, uh, different architectures, right, and so you had to have different uh, make files, right? That would be able to build uh, and compile and, and link uh, your code so that it would be you could compile it uh, for the Motorola, um, uh, 
uh, or Intel or you know, all different different types of uh, of CPUs, right? Uh, so so the same thing happened in um, in JavaScript, right? You have all these vendors having different versions, so so folks had to uh, had to write their code so that uh, they would have to guess or or identify what were the capabilities of the browser, right? So that um, your code would be compatible, right? So that that made it just a huge mess. So so in the in the mid two thousands, uh, jQuery uh, came became a very very popular solution to that problem, right? That um, that that basically tried to um, well, it was very successful at creating some kind of like a veneer or like an abstraction layer on top of the browsers, uh, so that developers could now develop uh, using just the jQuery language. And it would do translations down to the particular browser vendor that you were actually running in. Uh, somewhat what happened in Java. Java tried to do the same thing, the Java language, right? Where you would uh, presumably <laughs> code to one single language that uh, had, you know, to the virtual machine. Uh, and then that virtual machine could then be, you know, do translated to the down uh, the, the, the actual uh, architecture, right? Uh, so jQuery tried to solve the same issue. It was very successful. Um, all, all other uh, uh, variations to this theme, um, but not until 2010, there was a really huge breakthrough uh, in the maturity of the frameworks that were available uh, for building uh, user interface applications on a browser. Uh, you know, Google came up with uh, Angular, uh, Angular 1, uh, and it was just very, very successful. You know, it, it, uh, you know, it was... Um, uh, you know, it it it, it copied a lot, of, a lot of the ideas that were very successful on this side, right? On the server frameworks, a lot of the you know the J2EEs and .NETs, right? All that was invented a decade earlier, right? And was very very successful on the server side. Uh, Angular copied a lot of the, those same ideas and brought all the maturity, you know, all the design patterns uh, that um, that became very very popular on the server side. Right, and brought it over uh, to the to the client side, right, for the for the JavaScript uh, browser developers, uh, and this took off like crazy. You know, a lot of companies bought into this idea. They built a lot of uh, very sophisticated uh, web applications where they would do rendering on the client side using Angular. Uh, there were you know different uh, players uh, kind of used to doing the same kind of thing, even even nicer, but they didn't have they were not as successful. You know, Backbone, Ember, Sail, Meteor. You know, I would say I, I would I think these are even better uh, solutions, better than Angular, but they, they didn't have as much success. Uh, so, but Angular did a uh, um, a terrible mistake <laughs> uh, when they went uh, from version one to version two, uh, where you know they 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 got somewhat cocky uh, and um, and they were they started um, a they they started thinking of uh you know how could it be improved even better uh, and when they went to version two uh, the uh, all the um all the applications that you had written for uh, version one there was no clear path to migrate version one to version two uh, so so folks that had you know made a lot of investment uh, into building Angular applications using the first version. Um, you know, basically there was there was no way for them to monetize or to reuse all that effort, all that investment, and migrate it over to version two. Uh, so they were faced with a decision that says, "Well, what do we do? Um, if, if we want to migrate to version two, we're going to have to just rebuild the whole thing, right? The, the, our whole application. We, there's very little that we can reuse from version one. So so folks would say, "Well, might as well look at at uh, what other frameworks are out there, right?" And and Facebook React JS was right there at the right moment uh, for for these folks to discover uh, these alternate uh, solution and and uh, and React uh, it, it's not a full blown framework uh, it's a very simple library that it's it, it's only useful for rendering content rendering user interfaces right it was not a, as a breath uh, you know. Um, it, it didn't. It didn't take over the entire framework like 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 Angular does, right? Uh, it's only for the user interface, right? So so you you can you can mix and match uh, with other solutions, right? For uh, you know talking to the to a database or talking to a a, uh, 
uh, an API or whatnot, that, that's left to you. You could still you know, mix and match there as opposed to Angular being one monolithic solution. So anyway, uh, React became extremely popular and this is where we're gonna be focusing on uh, this semester. We're gonna be using React JS. Um, uh, so anyway, so so there's, there's um, uh, oh, so over time, there were two big types of solutions uh, that evolved uh, on, on how, uh, how these applications um, dynamically, uh, programmatically uh, interacted with users, right? And uh, dynamically, right? That, that, that users uh, generated events. Um, those events were translated into state change in the applications, and then those state changes were then rendered uh, for the user, right? Uh, the, the first solution uh, that, um, that where you, you see these server frameworks, the solution that these folks took at, at, uh, as a first approach of this, right? Using the common gateway interface, Java 2, .NET. Uh, so all these, all these uh, solutions um, uh, follow this same uh, structure, right? Where um, a user, Alice, might send a request, right? For maybe the uh, weather, right? Or the latest stock market, right? Tickers and whatnot. Um, and so because it was dynamic, right, the request could not go uh, to a, you, know, you would not ask for a static uh, HTML document, right, or text document. You would instead request uh, for something that was executed on the server. Uh, that was written in any any number of languages, such as ASP, or JSP, PHP, Python, right? Uh, and so these, these would execute on the server. The server would... Uh, query a database or go out to a file system or make some network connections to uh, NOAA or, 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 or maybe to the stock market, right? Yahoo Finance or Bloom, Bloomberg or whatever, right? Uh, it would gather results from those websites, right? And then it would compute a, um, a result, right? It would, it would write a static um, a text file, right? Right? Uh, that would then be streamed across the network, right, for the for the browser, and the browser, uh, you know, he would would be rendered this static content, which was dynamically generated, right, um, and then it would be rendered for for Alice to consume. So, so this is still a popular way of doing things, but um, most of uh, uh, this fell out of favor uh, in the mid two thousands, you know, when Angular uh, started to come out, right, in the but it became it, it 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 was almost entirely abandoned <laughs> this this uh, this way of doing things uh in um in in the you know 2010s and whatnot right um and if, in favor of this other other uh alternate way of doing things right so so the other alternative way of doing it so there's two big buckets right uh where this bucket we're going to say is server rendering server side rendering right you render the content what the user sees right from the from the server uh, then, then in, in 2010s, right, with uh, uh, Angular and um, Meteor and Sail uh, and React.js, right, um, we, you know, there was a big shift towards client-side uh, user user rendering, uh, where where it works this way, right. So Alice goes out and makes a request to the browser, uh, but this time it would not, it would, the request would not be sent out to something that would execute on the server. Instead. You would ask for a regular HTML document, right? Just a static uh, text document, and also a static uh, JavaScript file uh, that was code that was meant to be executed uh, on the client, right? So the code was going to be now executed on the client. So both of these things would render were, were brought over to the to the client side on the browser. The code would execute on the browser. Uh, now there's very little that you can do on a browser. The browser is very limited. Uh, it cannot go out to the file system. It uh, has this very limited network access, right? It has no database to speak of. Uh, so, so once the code executed on the on the browser, the brow the, the 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 code would realize that it didn't have any data, <laughs> that it would have to make another call, right? To go out to uh, Bloomberg, right? Go out to um, you know the uh, the Weather Channel or whatever, right? And, and go fetch data, right? Or even go back to the original uh, server, right? For data. That uh, that then the, these these servers these uh, different data sources would respond with some uh, formatted data set right uh, usually as JSON XML 
Uh, this JavaScript would uh, interpret and parse this content on the on the browser, all running on the browser, and it would manipulate the content in the browser to render this content. Right. So this became the de facto standard of how to um, build dynamic web applications. Right. Uh, and uh, but also there was a uh, there's a there's also a mixture of the two, right? There's the, these two can work together very nicely. Um, like for instance, uh, usually uh, landing pages or, or or screens that are fast performant pages, right? Uh, usually follow this this uh, architecture or rendering on the server, uh, since the server is so much faster than a browser, right? So you want to make sure that that content is pumped out to the user as fast as possible. Right, nobody wants to see these spinning wheels, right? As the as the, as the browser has to go go back to a server, right, for, to fetch for data. You you want to be able to see the content right away. Uh, but once you're in the uh, once you're in the main content of the browser of the browser having rendered this, right, then you would use JavaScript, right, to dynamically, you know, uh, lazy load more content, right, as you maybe as you scroll uh, throughout the screens, right, you fetch more content and later on, right. And then you render it uh, as you uh, as you browse to the content, right? Uh, today, actually, uh, we're kind of going back to this. <laughs> we're kind of going back to this server side uh, UI rendering with uh, Next.js, right? Where where now JavaScript that it was meant presumably to be executed on a, on a browser is now being executed on the server. So it kind of it's kind of like a pendulum, right? You you see technology kind of do this thing where uh, you know we were. Uh, we came from the 60s and 70s where you had monolithic, very powerful servers, and you have really dumb terminals uh, up until the 90s, uh, up until, yeah, early, early 90s, uh, to then everybody having a personal computer on their on their desktop, right, and and not, not so much relying on a centralized server. And then with the internet, we kind of go went backwards, right, or not backwards, we went back to the pendulum where the server now is very important, right? And this that's the centralized server, but now the desktop is so much more powerful. But but now servers are becoming the uh, all the applications are kind of be moving back to uh, being implemented on the server side, right? Uh, and then going back to rendering things on the client, uh, and then now things going back to being rendered on the server. So you you it's very common to see this uh, technology pendulum go by one way or the other, and it's it's nice to see these these patterns over time, right? It's kind of Gives you kind of a a, a a long view of technologies of where it could go right in the in the future. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah. So we're gonna be we're gonna be focusing on client side uh, UI rendering. Uh, if but if you do want to explore Next.js, I I strongly encourage you to continue uh, looking at that. Right? How how we're kind of going back to this right where JavaScript is running now on the server. Um, yeah. So. so that's a, a very broad introduction of what uh, what the internet is and the on the World Wide Web.